Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez, and my guest today is Herman Simon. Herman, welcome to the show. Henry, I look forward to our discussion. So, so do I. So what, what can we learn from, as Herman has coined, hidden champions? Hidden champions are mid-sized, relatively unknown companies that have quietly, under the radar, become world market leaders in their respective industries. And Herman Simon, the man who coined the term hidden champions, he's studied and written about these companies for decades, and he's my guest on this episode. To receive more information about the Howa business, including links to the show notes page for this episode, and how you can continue supporting my show and receive exclusive content and discounts through a Patreon membership, please visit thehowabusiness.com. So Herman Simon is a PhD and is a world-renowned management thinker, consultant, pricing expert, and an entrepreneur and the leading authority on hidden companies. And it's a business model as well. He is the founder and honorary chairman of Simon Kutcher and Partners, the world's leading price consultancy with over 1,700 employees and 42 offices worldwide. Simon is also the author of 40 books, that's 4-0, 40 books in 30 different languages, including worldwide bestsellers, Hidden Champions, which was first published by Harvard Business School in 1996, and most recently, True Profit, no company ever went broke turning a profit to profit as a seminal book on the ultimate objective of a business. And Simon's upcoming book, which I've had a chance to preview, is Hidden Champions in the Chinese Century, Ascent and Transformation. And it is an in-depth exploration of the ever-changing operating conditions, as well as the greater uncertainty and volatility that will define global business over the next 10 years with a particular focus on China's impact. Before committing himself to management consultant, Simon was a professor of business administration and marketing. And during his academic career, he was a visiting professor at Harvard Business School, Stanford University, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Simon is an honorary professor at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing, and the Herman Simon Business School in China, named after him, of course. In 1995, Simon put his hidden champion's blueprint into practice as an entrepreneur himself, founding his own consulting firm, as I mentioned, Simon Kutcher and Partners with Dr. Edward Kutcher, his first doctoral student. Simon Kutcher and Partners is now the global leader, as I mentioned, in pricing consultant. Herman lives in Bonn, Germany, so it's afternoon over there as we chat. Once again, Herman Simon, welcome to the show. Henry, thank you for the nice introduction. I appreciate it. No, no, no. It was hard to condense it to that because you have done so much, sir, so highly accomplished. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here and just get a little bit of that knowledge shared with us. And so I had the, the pleasure of reviewing the Hidden Champions book. So many questions there. But I thought we would start there, if you would, sir, if you ex- define for me, what are these hidden champions? We generally have a biased perception of the economy. When you ask people, what is the economy for you? They name the large companies, uh, General Motors uh, in the past, or Google, Alphabet, uh, et cetera, today. But the real economy is very different. How many separable markets do we have? Say 20,000, just to give you a number. Only 100 or 200 of these markets are served by large companies, and the rest is served by mid-sized and small companies. And among those, you have for each niche market, for each small market, you have a global market leader. But you never heard of them. That's why I call them the hidden champions, which is, of course, a contradiction. You normally know a champion, but hidden, what does that mean? And I investigated more than 3,000 of these hidden champions, and I can only say they are the best companies in the world. Many of them have market shares, global market shares of more than 50%. Some have 100% of their world market. 
excellent company, but operating behind the visible curtain. And I tried to, to detect their strategies, their secrets. I visited hundreds or thousands of them, investigated them over, over now 30 years. It's, it's fascinating. And then what's, what's very interesting, of course, is your home country in Germany has a disproportionate number of these hidden champions, right? Yeah, Germany has more than any other country. And uh, that explains the German export performance. On, on a per capita base, we export twice as much as our na European neighbors, France, Italy, United Kingdom, uh, almost 10 times more than the United States. And that is not due to the large German corporations, you know, uh, Volkswagen, Daimler, BMW, mm -hmm. Siemens, etc. But it's due to our strong mid-sized hidden champions, our unknown global market leaders. Did any of this have to do, I have to think in part, Herman, to, you know, particularly after the wars, Germany's economy and rebuilding it had to, to some extent, be focused on serving another market, selling to other countries. Was that is that part of the initial reason why these German companies are so good at exporting? Yeah, the the reasons are indeed indeed deeply rooted in history. Until 1918, Germany was not a nation state, but consisted of 23 monarchies and mm -hmm. three republics. So every entrepreneur who wanted to grow had to internationalize very quickly. Somebody right. in uh, Munich, that was the state of the kingdom of Bavaria, who was doing business with Berlin, the kingdom of Prussia, that was international business, and that has become part of the DNA of German entrepreneurs. So German entrepreneurs internationalize much more quickly than, for instance, American entrepreneurs or startups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. So what is what have you gleaned then at a high level to start introducing it? That is the business model, if you will, that could, that others can follow or at least try to, to follow and emulate. What is at the heart of that business model? Yeah, yeah. hold a lot of, of very important biz business lessons. And I would describe the, the, the core as consisting of three parts. First, the ambition to be the best in your market worldwide. And I could cite dozens of examples where they explicitly say that. Mm. Uh, Stiel, the global leader in chain source, for instance, says, we only do it if we can be the best. If we can't be the best, we don't do it. Mm. And in modern markets, uh, take DeepL, that's the best translation system in the world. They say, we want to provide the best machine translation in the world. There it starts with this entrepreneurial ambition. In our case, we wanted to be the best in pricing. So. Being the best, how do you achieve that? Through focus. Only focus leads to world class. You have to concentrate your competencies, your knowledge, your, your well-defined market. But focus makes a market small. So how do you make it big or large enough? By globalizing. Even a niche market gets large when you do it on a global scale. So these right. are the three most important strategy pillars, you could call them ambition to be the best, focus because only focus leads to world class and globalization because globalization makes each market large. The, the focus point is such an, a critical one, Herman, because I think that that's something certainly as small business owners, which is who who listens to this show, and I am a business, small business owner myself, we struggle with that sometimes because we, we think that the way to grow is by adding more offerings, more service, more products. And I think it's in part because we don't see, we see as that as the only way to probably grow as opposed to looking at where we can offer what we are best at in a, another market. That's a way to grow. In, in the worst case, it's diversification that you go into markets which you do not know or sell or make products where you are not really competent. 
But that's not the way to a world class or to even championship. You have to focus on something. Mm -hmm. We focus on, on pricing. We are not competing with McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group on restructuring, on, on supply chain. We focus on pricing and we are the best in pricing. You can only achieve that yeah. by, by uh, yeah, working for years on, on a topic, improving your products, um, hiring people who like to do that, to focus. And if you do that, you will become very, very good if you focus on something. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two points there. One is that you just touched on and I think is a struggle. I'm generalizing, but a struggle for us in the U.S. is to think longer term. We are, um, you know, we're so obsessed with the immediate gratification, and maybe this is around the world now, but that that focus requires a commitment over time to achieve that that supremacy, that that ambition to be the best in the market. It takes time, doesn't it? Absolutely, that's a very important point, and uh, I, I can kind of quantify that. The CEOs of the hidden champions stay at the helm, the average, mm. for 21 years. Wow. The average tenure of a CEO of a large corporation is six years. So I think that tells you everything about long-term orientation, continuity. And that, and does, that yeah. is an absolutely important aspect of hidden championship. And it also translates uh, to the employees. The average churn rate of hidden champions is 2.7% per year. For Germany, it's even 7.3%. For the US, it's about 20%. Mm. So if you want to have world-class employees, they have to stick with you, to stay with you, to get better and better over the years. So. It's continuity both on the level of leadership and the, on the level of the workforce. Yeah. And it's a, and then it's, it's got to be a culture that you've developed and you hire people to fit that yeah. culture. And then over time, that becomes part of who they are as well. How, how did you, are there some examples at how, of how at Simon and Kutcher, as an example, you foster or develop that culture? We started with a very small team, as you said, myself and my first doctoral student, and we hired highly qualified people. Today we have 1,800, actually. Of those, my guess is that 150 have a PhD in business or economics, usually focus on pricing. So we are high tech, and uh, we have a partnership model where Young people can become partners, co-owners of the company, mm. and that is an important loyalty instrument for us. So uh, most of the partners stay their whole life. One thing I'm particularly proud of. So Dr. Kucha was my first student, the second joined us, the third and the fourth joined us. And these four people together with me worked their whole life at Simon Kutcher. Wow. So we have, again, the same model of continuity of long-term orientation, mm -hmm. because what is even more time-consuming than, say, perfectionizing the products is the process of globalization. You need decades to build your own global organization. And in every new country, it's the same challenge. When we came to the US in 1996, nobody knew us. But still, we managed to hire some very competent people who stayed uh, until today with us from, mm. from very good business schools. That's amazing. So it's in the people, it's in the culture, it's building yeah. loyalty, uh, long-term orientation, continuity. These are beyond pure technical competencies are the secrets of Sweden champions. Yeah. Do you, do you see, at least in the States, and I'm sure it's the same around the world, that the younger generation looks for something perhaps different from their employer, or maybe it's the same, and maybe what these companies are providing is what they've been looking for all along, but what have you, have you seen a shift or a change in how to attract and retain younger employees? I, I 
think the initial expectations have changed are different, but when people get used to a corporate culture, which they really like, where they feel competent, uh, comfortable, and but also challenged, they will adjust, they will come to different evaluations and, and judgments. And um, in, in that sense, Corona, during Corona, we had a higher churn rate with, with the consultants, but normally it has been rather stable over the years. Mm -hmm. in, in consulting, you have a high churn rate of the employees, about 15%. That has not uh, changed in, in the long term, I think. Mm -hmm. And the ones who stay on then stay on forever. And, and that is a very important, this selection process in the early stage of employment, but in the, in the following stages, that you retain the people who have the abilities, the motivation you need, and that you separate from the ones who do not fit into this pattern. Yeah, understood. All right, I want to take a step back because I jumped right into it because I was so excited to talk about Hidden Champions, but, but I want to understand a little bit more about your journey if I got it right, you started, you you lived on a farm as a child and, you know, ended up with a PhD. So let's go back a little bit and then we'll come back to the book about your early days and, and that life and how it's influenced you and how it impacts what you do today. I really, I grew up on a farm, on a very small farm in a very small village in the Middle Ages, because in the 1950s <laughs> we had... No machines, wow. uh, we had no tractors, it was always horses and, and manual labor. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to high school as one of the very few uh, boys from our village. And uh, then I joined the Air Force for a couple of years. My, my youth dream was to become a, a jet pilot ah. that didn't materialize because of uh, partial color blindness. And during my time in the military, I, I, I developed uh, interest in, in business and economics. And so I started uh, to study economics at the University of Bonn, which is the best university in this field in Germany. And so it went on. And, and, and there's also a very important lesson for one's own career. I, I never had the big long-term plan, but I did the job well which I was doing right now. And we, when you do that, new opportunities open. And so I, I stumbled into the studies of economics. Uh, a professor offered me the opportunity to get a PhD. I became a professor. It, it's always in phases where you really try hard to do your best and then new opportunities will open up. I would never have thought uh, when I was 25 that I would become an entrepreneur lead a, a global consulting company, et cetera, or become a professor, do the job right, which you are doing now, and opportunities will open. That's my recommendation for my own career and experience. Very interesting. But when you were that age, when you were 25, did you feel any stress, Herman, about having to answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up, or you know, have that plan? Did you feel any of that stress? Not really, because I made these decisions step by step. Um, after the Air Force, I decided to study economics. When I finished my graduated, I got the opportunity to go for a PhD. Then I did that. At that time, my intention was to go into industry, to a large corporation, to become a manager. But then the opportunity opened up to become a professor. So I... I didn't feel stressed. I was waiting for the next opportunity and then I had to decide. Mm -hmm. I, I feel, uh, you know, having raised my daughter who's in her early 20s now and observed it, I, it seems to me like young people now have so much pressure on them to make a decision about what they're going to do for the rest of their life. Do you, yeah. do you see that yeah. as well? Absolutely. And my recommendation would be the same as my experience, that I say, don't decide now what the rest of your life will be, what you do in 20 or 30 years. Do what you like. So if you prefer a certain uh, study or, or what, a certain profession or whatever it is, 
do it now and do it to the best to your abilities. And then you will see how it develops. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think much of people who know at the age of 20 what the rest of their life will be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible. Yeah. When you think how much has changed since the time I was 20, 20 something in, in the 1970s, and you could not predict the world. There was no internet. Uh, there, there was nothing compared to the technologies we have today. And how can you plan then when you are 20, what will happen if we have artificial intelligence, which is superhuman in, in 30 years from now. So plan for the next three, five, at most 10 years, and not for the rest of your life. Yeah, I agree. And we have such a, for most of us, if we we're fortunate to be born in the right places and maybe have the, the doors that open with education. We have the opportunity to reinvent ourselves multiple times in our lifetime, don't we? Absolutely. And let's hope that not the same happens, uh, what, what happens today to the people in Ukraine. We just had a couple right. of women with children here, uh, refugees. They don't have a choice. They don't have much choice. They, exactly. they are controlled by, by superior forces. And we are in the lucky situation to can we are. decide, to select, to have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at that age, you know, so you went then into academics, a professor. Did you have thoughts or aspirations of owning your own firm, your own business? I had the ambition as a professor or as an academic. Uh, not to confine myself to theoretical research, but to have an impact on practice. Mm -hmm. So how can you have an impact on practice either as a consultant or going into practice as an entrepreneur or as a manager? So the ambition to have an impact on practice was there, but the concrete form was not developed and it developed over time. I did some consulting on the side uh, when, I, when I became a young professor. It worked, and eventually I decided to leave the university and to focus full time on the consulting business. And there I followed the hidden champion strategy one to one. Mm -hmm. We applied this strategy one to one. And it's interesting because with Simon Kutcher, you weren't manufacturing anything. So it was different in that regard, right? Yeah, but that, that doesn't make a difference if you manufacture a product or provide a, a service. This ambition, focus, globalization thing applies to both sectors, to, yep. to goods and to services. That makes sense. In each, in each field, you can be the best or you can at least strive to be the best. Uh, in most sectors, you can also internationalize. And internationalization was a very important step for us. I came full-time on board as CEO in 1995. And in 96, we opened our second office. Before wow. that, we had only an office in Bonn. Where did we open our second office? Not in Switzerland or another German-speaking country, but in Boston in the United States <laughs> of America, because that's the lion's stand in consulting. And we said, if we want to become a global consultant, we have to prove ourselves in the most challenging market, and that's the United States. Mm -hmm. So that required some courage, patience. Uh, we had to overcome many, many, many problems, resistances. Uh, nobody knows you when you are in, in, uh, coming into a new market. But the ambition to try it was there, and luckily it worked. Was the focus even at the beginning on pricing or was it yes, a broader yes. service? Okay. No, actually the focus was more pointed in the beginning. Actually, the idea of price consulting came from an encounter with Philip Kotler. Philip Kotler, then professor at Northwestern University, is a global marketing guru. I visited him. That was in January 1979. I said... Uh, I, I do pricing research. He said, oh, and I want to have an impact on practice. He said, every academician wants to have an impact on practice, but nobody <laughs> achieves it. And then he said, I know one guy in Chicago who calls himself price consultant. That hmm. was eye-opening for me. So you obviously can make a living on price consulting. And since this was my research topic in academia, I applied it to practical problems. And so it developed over time. Not from the one day to the next, but over, over many years. 
This is Henry Lopez with a brief break from this episode to share a special offer from our new show sponsor, Roll by ADP. It's no secret that starting a business causes stress and can sometimes feel like it's you against the world. So you need the right partner by your side. Like Roll by ADP, a chat-based mobile payroll app built with small business owners in mind. Roll simplifies the payroll process, making running payroll as easy as sending a text, really, and lets you pay employees, including contractors, freelancers, even yourself, directly from your mobile device. On top of that, Roll helps you stay in compliance, giving you one fewer thing to stress over. Since Roll is an app, you can say goodbye to stacks of paper everywhere, and it always has your back, offering 24-7 live chat support and step-by-step -step guidance. And Roll is backed by the payroll experts at ADP, giving you industry-leading security, expertise, and reliability. Welcome to a better way of doing business. Visit getroll.com slash howabusiness today and get your first three months free. So on that topic of pricing, Herman, what, what are some thoughts for us as very small business owners? What, what are some, let's start with some things you see that we get wrong or we misunderstand about pricing our products or services. Yeah. Let me, let me give you two points, which are easy to remember. First, I'm asking, are you a follower of Karl Marx? Are you a Marxist? I would say that 99% of the entrepreneurs and uh, startups uh, guys say, no, I'm not a Marxist, for heaven's <laughs> sake. And then I ask, but why then do you apply Marxist pricing? What is Marxist pricing? The most famous theory of Karl Marx was the labor value theory, which says that value is only created through the labor input. So the value of a product is defined by the labor input into this product. And that's exactly the same as cost plus pricing because mm -hmm. all costs are ultimately labor costs. Mm -hmm. So I say, please get rid of Marxist pricing. Cost plus pricing is a wrong approach. That's the first lesson. The second, I've been asked thousands of times, what is the most important aspect of pricing? And my answer is always the same. It's value, or more precisely, value to customer, even more precisely, perceived value to customer. And the old Romans in their Latin language understood that better than we do understand it today. They have the same word, pretium, like in precious, pretium for value and price. So this is the fundamental, you could say, eternally valid equation of pricing. Value and price must be balanced. Value equals pretium equals price. So you have to create value, you have to understand value, you even have to quantify it because the price is a number and you have to understand, are you 10% better than your competitor, only five, only 15? That makes a huge difference. It makes all the difference for your pricing. Or is your value less Then you have to offer it at a lower price? So the two lessons, avoid Marxist cost plus pricing. Second, value equals price. And if you observe these two lessons alone, you are already in the top quarter of prices in this world or in the top 10%. Right. It's brilliant stuff. Thank you for sharing that. A bunch of questions here. So the challenge, though, I had to see, though, Herman, is that we fall into the cost plus pricing model because we are ubiquitous. We are, we are just another offering. We have not differentiated. We haven't found the niche. We haven't focused on what we're best at. And so all we've left or we're left with is competing on price sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. That happens to the majority of companies probably, but then your solution is not in the price, but you have to improve your value. Your value. Or if you can supply the same value, at lower costs. 
then you can compete on price. I see. Because then you can afford to charge a low, lower price and still have enough profit margin. So the, the solution for most companies is not in the price and such, but in getting the value right. But if they cannot be superior on the value side, you must be lower on the cost side. Otherwise, you can forget true profit. In, in my experience, and, and my thought is here that the challenge with value is it has to be effectively communicated uh, so that the customer will realize it, perceive it, value it. So that means the sales and marketing have to be in alignment with communicating effectively that value. Is that fair? That is a very important part, but not the only part. First, you have to create value through the product or the service. It really has to actually deliver value, not just be sales. Yeah. And then you have to communicate it. But the, the root is actually the starting point is to really understand your customer. What do they see as effective value contributors? For instance, let's look at the electric car. I, I still have a diesel, but I have to buy a new one. And you know what, for me, the only criterion is the range. Mm. And on, on that criterion, almost all of them are lousy. Mm -hmm. There are only two good ones. That's Tesla. And the best one is Mercedes. Mm. All the others are so lousy. Mm -hmm. So they, they even, either haven't understood me or they are not able to solve the problem, but Tesla and Mercedes are able. That's a little more expensive, but I am willing. I'm not the, the average customer, right. but I am willing to pay more for a reasonable range that I don't have to stop and, and recharge the car every, every 200 miles or so. And that's the value that that product delivers for you. That is your. That is for me the killer, the killer criterion for value of, it, of an electric car. Right. Because I, I assume that the brakes will work and the, the, the doors close, etc. So the, 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 the so called hygiene factors, which simply have to be there, don't differentiate. For me, the differentiator is the range. I can drive with one charge of the battery. Just an example, and I'm not, ex, uh, not, not yet typical for the market. There may be another customer who says, I mostly pay attention to a low price. I anyway drive only short distances without, within my city, where the range does not play such an important role, but I often drive longer distances. And mm -hmm. it would for me be a killer if I have to stop every hour and a half to recharge the batteries. Right, right. All right, I want to go back to the customer point. That's in the book, Hidden Champions, we, we've touched on the key things, ambition, the focus, the globalization, and then you just referred to customers. And as you explained in the book, that closeness to customers, this is an important point I want you to elaborate on, Herman, if you would, because this is a common mistake that I see as business owners. We get busy inside of our business, taking care of problems, and we get very disconnected from the end consumer, and that's a big mistake. But but tell me about that and how the yeah. champion, the hidden champions, do this well. The closeness or proximity to customers is actually the biggest strength of hidden champion. It's they are very good in technology, but their biggest strength is proximity to customers. And you see that also reflected in in numbers and in the corporate culture. For instance, in large corporations, only 8% of the employees have regular customer contacts, hmm. Salesforce, service people. In the Hidden Champions, 38% of the workforce have regular customer contacts. Wow. And that extends to the top management. Just to give you an example. Um, I was many years ago on the board of the global leader in paint shops for the automobile industry. There's a mm. company called Dürr in Stuttgart, Germany. And I was traveling in the US and read in a, in a, in a local newspaper in the Midwest that uh, they had problems in a General Motors factory with the painting process because the workers use and hairspray, which contained metallic particles. Hmm. So I cut this 
piece from the newspaper there in Detroit or where it was out and sent it to the CEO in Stuttgart, Germany, of a, of a company which is now a $4 billion uh, company, so not a small one. He called me back and said, I know exactly this case. I have been in the factory. They have a equipment from our competitor, but we have a solution next time. It will be our turn to equip their new factory to avoid this problem. So the CEO of a four billion company in Germany somewhere knew exactly the problems of a customer in the Midwest somewhere in the US. That mm. is for me um, a role model of closeness to customer. Beginning at the top and uh, 38% of all employees have regular customer contacts. How does a larger company like that achieve that, Herman? I mean, part of what I've seen done is to rotate people, to move people around, yeah, or yeah. part of their onboarding is to spend time with the customer. Are those the things that they're doing to get that level of exposure? Yeah. There, there are many, many, many tricks. Um, for instance, the CEO of another that's also quite large hidden champion, he Helps, uh, holds a meeting every month, every two months with the service technicians. That's a mm. global leader in, in bottling systems. And the CEO says what the engineers in the, in the development, research and development tell me their perfections, et cetera, their technical ideas. That's for me not a, as important as what the service technicians feed back to me. Mm -hmm. Because they experience the problems the customers have in their, in their plants, and they really know what the concerns of the customers are. Right. And the CEO spends a couple of hours every month or every two months with this group to get the direct feedback from these hands-on service technicians. It, it's just one example. And you can, of course, include people from the research and development department in such a from the engineering department in such a meeting. Uh, of course, they are better educated than the service technicians, but they must know what the customer uh, problems are on a day-to-day on -day base. Mm -hmm. And how they're actually using the product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, take a, a right turn here, just touch a moment. Uh, obviously, since at least in the States, we're in these inflationary times. What are your thoughts going back to the topic of pricing and how we bring inflation into the equation. I just uh, finalized the book, Defeating Inflation. So that will be the next one. And I can only say that's a very, very serious problem. Uh, it affects not only price or the sales force, it affects all functions of a company, cash management, supply chain, et cetera. And I come back to the cost plus Marxist approach. It's naive that you can simply pass through your cost increases to your customers. You have to very carefully look at the willingness of the customers to pay. Mm -hmm. Are they willing to pay more? Are they resisting? And um, that is a, a very tricky issue. And you have to, to accept that you have to absorb a part of the problem. The, my, my percentages are the follow. If you have a cost increase of 10%, you can absorb half of that. Five the cost increase in, in my supply chain uh, of 10%. Yeah, 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 in your supply chain, including labor cost uh, mm -hmm. parts you buy, et cetera. Let's just to make it simple to have a round number 10. You can then pass through, typically that's our experience, 50% of that, so 5% through price increases. You can achieve 2% by cost uh, efficiencies, and you have to swallow 3%, at least for the time being until everything has adjusted. Mm -hmm, for a period of time. And concerning the price increases, two recommendations. First, be agile, be fast. Don't wait until the costs have actually increased and then you come with a lag, time lag of, of three months. This destroys your annual 
profit. Yeah. We we see that in the uh, in the in the the gas refining industry, right? Where we we yeah, they they anticipate quite, that, right? Yeah, they are very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So do it fast. Do it. Don't fast. be shy. Don't be timid. Yeah. And then it's better to increase the price several times in small steps. Okay. Than to wait half a year or a year to make the big step. Okay. Uh, so these are two very clear uh, recommendations from based on our experience, fast and rather frequently in small steps. I mean, we have had a period, uh, 10 years, actually 30 years of, of price stability, mm -hmm. where you could afford to increase the price once per year by one two, three percent. If the average inflation rate was two percent, right. it means the average price increase has been two percent. Mm -hmm. Now, you may have to increase your price eight times per year. Uh, mm -hmm. A tire manufacturer in, in Germany has already increased their prices four times this year. And, and that's exactly the right method. And that's a huge challenge for the sales force. Yeah. Also for the management, because we do not have experience. The last mm -hmm. inflation period was in the 1970s, and the guys from that time are no longer around. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't know how to deal with these problems. You, you have to uh, psychologically harden the sales force. They were not used to go every uh, four or six weeks to the customer and say, we, we have to increase price. We want a higher price. The customer kicks you out, and uh, <laughs> it will be very tough for the sales force. Yeah, but but listen, it is what it is. I think you can also try to use it, obviously, as a motivator to to turn it to your advantage from a sales perspective. But yeah, that's that's easy for yeah, me to and, say. Uh, it it goes further. It's not just about higher or lower price. It's also about changing the pricing model. Yeah. For instance, going from a, a model where you buy. Let me give you an example. Michelin is a global leader in tires, mm -hmm. and uh, they introduced a system where they charge per mile. It's also very popular in the US, for instance, with school buses. Instead, they, they introduced that when they had a new tire, which um, had 25% um, more mileage. You mm -hmm. cannot increase the price by 20% for right. the truckers. and got to change the pricing model. They changed the pricing model to price per kilometer or per mile. And they have sensors, so that's automated. And that is accepted. So one, one guy from, from BASF, uh, the, the biggest chemical company, but if we don't change our pricing model now, what, when do we do it? We'll mm -hmm. never do it. Now is the opportunity to think about a new pricing model, which creates less resistance from the customer side. Again, it requires deep understanding of, of the customer's willingness to pay, how, he, how they see value, et cetera. And that is a big business for us as price consultants right now, changing pricing models. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. That's uh, very practical. And for everybody listening, I'll have it laid out on the show notes page, this example that we can follow as small business owners for how to increase our pricing. Thanks for sharing that, Herman. I appreciate it. All right. One last question before we'll, we'll start to close. I'm curious. I want to go back to the, the point that there are so many disproportionately per capita, the highest of these hidden companies in Germany. Why is Germany such a great environment for entrepreneurs at a high level? Why, why is this such a great place to be an entrepreneur? I think a very important part is that we have the best educated workforce. We have what we call the dual vocational training system, where young people work for three days in a week in a company and get a modest salary. And for two days, they visit, they attend a vocational training school. So they get a very good education in theory and practice. And when you start a company, you cannot do it on your own. So you need a team. You need a team of qualified people. And I think that is one of the foundations of our, our performance, of the quality of our products, 
and it applies also to uh, people who studied at technical universities. Uh, I think te in, in technology, we are much better than we are perceived from the outside. Mm. Let me just give you one example, a very modern example. You probably never heard of LSTM. That stands for long short term memory. Um, you, you, do you use Siri from Apple or Alexa from Amazon? LSTM is the software behind the system. And LSTM from the developed by a professor from the Technical University of Munich is installed on more than 3 billion, billion smartphones, more than 3 billion smartphones. And since we are talking about Apple, how many suppliers does Apple have in Germany? Mm. A guess, would you like to, to guess, to oh, give gosh. an estimate? How many suppliers does Apple have in Germany? I don't know, probably not that many, I, I would be my guess. So give me a number, I a number. Guy. Um, I don't know, 100. 767. Wow. And you don't know any of them. No. LSTM is one. So there is this hidden technical, technological power in Germany, which, which is not visible because it's behind the visible mm -hmm. surface of the products right, we use. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to see that company on a billboard or something like no, that. No, no. And, and they, they don't go, uh, don't do advertising because it makes, makes no sense for that. That's right. That's LSTM right. probably has uh, five or 10 uh, customers in the world. And, and many of these specialists, I mean, 70, 80% are in B2B markets and many of them have very few customers all over the world. There's one hidden champion that's a group of Dutch and, um, and two German company, uh, they make so-called extreme ultraviolet lithography systems. These systems cost billions on which the ever more miniaturized chips are made. They are monopolies. And uh, nobody else can make these extreme machines, but mm -hmm. nobody knows them. They don't sell to end customers. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. All right. Educated workforce is, is at the heart of it from, uh, from what you're yeah, sharing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, let's summarize the books you write. You're such a prolific writer. Again, a, the recent book that we've touched on is True Profit. No company ever went broke turning a profit. And the upcoming book, it'll be released here soon, is called Hidden Champions in the Chinese Century, Ascent and Transformation. Those are the two most recent books, correct, si uh, correct, Kyle yes, Herman? Yes, yes. Excellent. All right, very good. Let's wrap it up, as I always do, with one thing you want us to take away from this conversation. I know it was far-reaching, but what, what's the one thing you want us to take away? When you read my autobiography, Many Worlds, One Life, a remarkable journey from farmhouse to global stage, you will find one slogan which actually goes back to the Roman philosopher Seneca. That's per aspera ad astra. It means on rough roads to the stars. So you should have the stars in your view. You should have a vision, but be prepared that you do not reach the stars on smooth roads. It will be on rough roads. You have to overcome resistances, problems, everything. Never give up. Never lose the sight of the stars, but be prepared for per aspera ad astra. Love that. Very inspirational. And so, of course, applicable to a small business owner's journey. Thank you for sharing that. Tell us where you would like us to go online to learn more, Herman. HermanSimon.com. That's my homepage. Perfect. Very simple. And we will have a, a link to it as well on the show notes page. But again, it's Herman with two N's, HermanSimon.com. Herman, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today, sharing all of this knowledge and insight. Um, it was a great conversation. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. You're welcome, Henry. This is Henry Lopez. And thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again was Herman Simon. I release new episodes every Monday morning, and you can find a show anywhere you listen to podcasts, 
including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.